Carl, I'm looking at a couple of comments. The comments are rolling in here, by the way, uh, with the uh, with the uh, you know the, the material that we've been putting up on the on the uh, YouTube and the blog and so on. Uh, people are excited about this um, about this new book, Final Warning, and uh, we've been doing some preliminary posting of uh, you know brief uh, brief uh, synopses of. You know what people can expect when they read the book. Uh, here's just a couple of comments. Uh, superb teaching. I was also brought up on the pre-trip trip teaching, but I don't see it in the Bible. Christians have an inherent weakness for following men and their teaching without testing what they hear against the Word of God. Praise God for the Internet. <laughs> I'm from Wales, UK, so he's over there in Wales, and would not have a hope of hearing stuff like this. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Would not have a hope of hearing stuff like this without the Internet. Uh, I've just pre-ordered your new book and can't wait for it to arrive. Once again, in Jesus' name, thank you and God bless. And here's one more, Carl. I dropped the last shreds of my pre-trib uh, after living in Turkey for five years. I always had trouble reading Matthew 24 in context and then believing what I had been taught about the rapture. While in Turkey, I discovered the pre-trib rapture theory was less than 150 years old and was a Western cult, uh, church doctrine. Uh, I challenge you to... St- to spend time in Islamic countries and listen to believers who suffer and die for their faith. It will change your life. Carl Gallops, thanks for coming on the show here. Uh, Mike, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is a this is a topic near and dear to my heart, and thank you for, for mentioning my book, Final Warning is the name of it, Are We Living in the Trumpet Days, uh, Understanding the Trumpet Days of Revelation. But this is, I, I just want the listeners to know, this is not some new teaching with me. It's not some sensational understanding of the scriptures that I've pulled out of my back pocket to write a sensational book. I've been preaching and teaching this stuff for 30 years. Now, that doesn't make me right in and of itself, but it does mean that I've been studying this, comparing Bible to Bible, Scripture to Scripture, preaching in prophecy conferences, revivals, Bible conferences, my own congregation for 28 years, producing videos and uh, 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 CDs and teaching series and and putting myself up for peer review for three decades. And I have yet to have any pre-tribber who has been able to refute biblically staying in the scriptures, biblically refuting what God has shown me. Now, I'm not the only one the Lord has shown this to. I mean, many, many, you know, uh, teachers and explorers of the word have seen this, but but now I've put in a book what I've been seeing over the last 25, 30 years, and particularly as it relates not just to the rapture and the timing of the rapture, but even more important than that, is the fact that we're living in the trumpet days of Revelation right now. Think things that were coded in the Bible, Mike, by by key words. I'm not talking about secret Bible code stuff. I'm talking about plain text key words that in the last 100 years, and most of them in the last 20, 30, 40 years, have come to pass before our very eyes, Mike. And so we're living in prophetic times. We're living in biblical times. And it's time for people to wake up Put the scriptures in their context, study the word, let the Bible interpret the Bible, and stay out of rabbinical, orthodox, Mishnah, and Talmud tradition, and stay away from the speculative, uh, isogetical interpretation of, you know, of, of various people, and, and the charts, and the graphs, and the maps, and the Left Behind series. I mean, get out of that. Get into the Word and let the Bible interpret the Bible, and people will be amazed at what the Bible really says about all this. Well, listen, uh, you may not know this about me, but uh, before uh, before I was honored with uh, taking on the role as uh, Executive uh, Director of P.P. Simmons, uh, before you and I even, even met, uh, I wrote uh, my first book, uh, which which dealt with tithing and money and all that, and I wrote a bonus chapter at the back as people, uh, the book draws to a close, and then there's a bonus chapter, and that bonus chapter uh, deals with the rapture of the church and uh, what, the timing of it and everything. So yeah, no, the Lord has been enlightening people to the to these facts, these uh, existential realities for a long time, uh, and this isn't a new uh, cultic vision that uh, Carl Gallops has conjured up in his mind. I mean. People have been talking about this for for uh, for decades and uh, you know hundreds of years. Uh, the facts, as they are laid out in the Bible, uh, are clear and and decisive. And uh, you, now you have, uh, I believe, the Lord has tapped you like like no like none other to uh, to accurately and and succinctly uh, uh, display the facts as they are laid out in the Bible with respect to the rapture of the church. 
Uh, and uh, I don't know. It seems to me, Carl, I may be uh, over exaggerating this a little bit, but uh, it seems to me like uh, you've uh, you've brought about some some factors here that sort of put a um, uh, put the final uh, required nail in the coffin of the pre-trib uh, Darbyist uh, doctrine here. Now, Darbyism. I don't know. Nelson uh, John Nelson Darby. He did not invent the uh, the uh, pre-trib rapture but like like Darwin of his day you know they were contemporaneous figures he and Darwin uh, Darwin did not invent the theory of evolution he popularized it and right. um, and uh, and likewise for Darby Darby didn't invent it but he did popularize it and uh, and uh, you know he's known as the, as uh, one of the key figures who who got that particular teaching out there uh, and uh, this uh, final warning and, and, and all of your teaching on the rapture really does put the final nail in the coffin on this. I really believe a lot of people are going to be woken up by this. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, well, well, thank you for your kind words. I appreciate it. I give uh, the Lord all glory and honor and credit uh, where it is due to him, of course, because, because I... <laughs> You know, it, it's not me that has put the final nail in the coffin, but it's the Word of God. And God, right. I, I, I mean, you, you know, and I know you know that. I'm not parsing your words. I'm just saying I want people to understand that I, I don't have some puffed up understanding of my role in this. I've, I've just been a student mm-hmm. of the Word for, for mm-hmm. decades and, and, and a preacher and teacher and a pastor. And, and uh, you, you know, I don't earn my living off of writing books or being sensational. I, you know, I'm a pastor and have been for a long time. So I, I have the freedom to just take the Word for what it says and to study it in an, in an uh, exegetical fashion, contextual fashion, and just preach the truth and, and what the Bible says. And so, Mike, yeah, I'm going to present a scenario here to you and the listeners. Of course, you know where I'm going because we've talked about this immensely, but I, I want to present something to the, to the listeners here just as an example. And we could talk for hours. I have example after example from the Scriptures, but let me just give one of the nails that goes in the coffin of, uh, of, of pre-trib. Um, the pre-trib rapture theory says that the seven trumpets, as presented in the book of Revelation, that those are judgments or, or parts of God's wrath, if you will, uh, that come upon the world after the church has been raptured. Uh, that's what they say. Now, mm-hmm. the problem is I can prove to you from the scriptures that not only is that statement wrong, but it is as unbiblical as any statement could be. And if that is true, If the pre-tribbers are that mistaken, if they are that out of context biblically, what else is wrong with the pre-trib rapture theory? You know, I I just want to ask that question right up front before before I expose it. So I want to give something for people to think about. But but now let let me present this. And I know that as I present it, those that are rabid pre-tribbers, and you know, I'm not being ugly about this. Listen, I was raised in the pre-trib rapture understanding. My family was, my wife was, my wife's family was. I was raised in the Deep South and the Bible Belt, cut my teeth on on, uh, Schofield's reference notes, Bibles. All of my early Bibles were that. But about 30 years ago, I just started comparing the Scripture to Scripture, like I'm getting ready to do here on the radio. And and I realized the pre-trib rapture theory is not biblical and mm-hmm. and I and I don't say that lightly I mean it really rocked my world when I discovered this and so here's one example folks in revelation chapter 10 verse 7 John says but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel now the voice of the seventh angel is the seventh trumpet and and that's clear he's very clear about that so I'm just going to put the words in there in the days of the seventh trumpet all right in the days of the voice of the seventh angel the seventh trumpet When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, Mm -hmm. as he has declared to his servant the prophets. Now, that's Revelation 10.7. So let me just paraphrase. John says, at the last of this series of seven trumpets, the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, at the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be revealed. It'll be finished. It'll be over. We'll all see what it is. The world will see at the last trumpet. All right. That's what John says in Revelation 10.7. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 52, 30 years earlier, he said, Behold, I tell you the mystery. Right. Now, remember, remember what John said. He said, in the tr- at the last trumpet, in the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is going to be finished. Paul, 30 years old, oh, earlier, said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, if he stopped right there, that would be pretty cool. But he went on right. to say, at the last trumpet, 
Mm-hmm. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Now, prior to writing that, he wrote the church at Thessalonica, and he said, in chapter 4, he said, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, that's what John's talking about, the voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are, who are still alive and are left will be caught up, that's where we get the word rapture, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. All right, so so folks, just, just listen. Paul, 30 years prior to John writing Revelation. Now, how do we know that? Well, because John wrote Revelation in the 90s, 90, 95 A.D. Paul died in 67 A.D. Uh, so, so, you know, do the math. Um, but Paul, 30 years prior to John saying anything about trumpets and lists of trumpets and a series of trumpets and a last trumpet, Paul said... The mystery of God is going to be revealed at the blowing of a trumpet. And then he tells the Corinthian church, as a matter of fact, he says, it's the last trumpet. And the mystery of God is the rapture of the church. Now, now, the pre-tribbers have a hard time dealing with this. And so they have to go outside the Bible to explain it. And, And see, Mike, that's where I just, my heart just sinks in my shoes when pre tribbers begin to try to unravel this connection between Revelation 10, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, they have to go outside the Bible because they'll say things like, well, well, now, uh, John wasn't talking about Paul and Paul wasn't talking about John and the trumpets. Paul was talking about a different series of trumpets. Right? That's one of the first things they say. Right. And then I always ask, okay, what series of trumpets? Where is there another series of trumpets? Let's start with the New Testament because that's where Paul is and that's where John is. Where is there another series of trumpets in the Bible? Well, there's not one. And they'll say, well, he, he, he wasn't talking about trumpets that are in the Bible. He was talking about other trumpets. Well, wait a minute. So now we're going to just jump outside the Bible, and we're going to assume Paul was talking about something different than John. Wouldn't, John have, wouldn't Paul have said that? Wouldn't John have said that? Wouldn't right. Paul have said, now I'm not talking about a, a series of trumpets from, you, 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 you know, from John's revelation. I'm talking about a different trumpet, and here is one. But he doesn't do that. Now, mm. so what trumpet, what series of trumpets outside the Bible is he talking about? And the pre-tribbers say, and uh, John Hagee uh, is one of the fa- most famous in one of his recent books, um, Blood Moons, he says, mm-hmm. he says, oh, well, what Paul's talking about is he's talking about the great trump. And he says, mm. if, he says, if you think otherwise, you're just mistaken. And that's all he says, and he moves on. Well, but let's examine that. The great trump, first of all, that's, that, the words the great trumpet are found only once in the Bible. And it's in Isaiah, and I'll, I'll quote to you the verse in a moment. I think it's chapter 17. I may be off on that, and I can find it in just a second. I've got it in my notes, but I'm doing all this off the top of my head right now. Sure. But, but, and, but in that in that one verse in all the Bible where the word great trump is used, it has nothing to do with the rapture. It's about God bringing his people out of captivity and back into the land. And some think it refers to the last days, but historically and contextually, it refers to the Persian decree of, of Cyrus for the people to return home and to rebuild the temple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And God says, I will do this with a great trumpet sound. That, that mm. That's all. Okay. Now, so... It doesn't come from the Bible. This understanding of the great trumpet at the rapture does not come from the Bible. Nowhere. Right, you say, well, what great trumpet is Paul talking about? He can't be talking about the one in Isaiah because that's not connected to the rapture. And the pre-tribbers will say, and this is what John Hagee says and many others, they will say, oh, he's talking about the last trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets mm-hmm. or what's called the great trumpet of the Feast of, of, of Atonement which, of Mm -hmm. course, atonement comes right after the Feast of Trumpets. And then my answer to that is, wow, so you've made the jump. You've gone outside the Bible now, and you're talking about the last trumpet at these two feasts. And people would say, wait a minute, what do you mean outside the Bible? Those are biblical feasts. Yes, they are, but nowhere in the Bible are there prescriptions for series of trumpets and there are no names for any of the trumpets. Well, where did the name Last Trumpet or the Great Trumpet come from? They came from rabbinical teachings in the Mishnah and the Talmud, from the <clears throat> Orthodox Jewish rabbis who invented them, put them over and above the Word of God. 
All the Bible says, Mike, about the Feast of Trumpets is Leviticus 23, where it says, on this one day, you are to blow the trumpets throughout the land. That's all it says. It doesn't right. say anything about series of trumpets. It doesn't say anything about naming the trumpets. It doesn't say anything about how to blow the trumpets. But the rabbis, over hundreds and hundreds of years, they invented series of trumpets, names of trumpets, how to blow the trumpets, what blast to blow them with. And this is rabbinical teaching. It's not biblical teaching. And then the Bible also speaks of the Day of Atonement, and it says, on that day, blow a trumpet. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, so they're supposed to blow a trumpet on that day. But the rabbis have now prescribed that at the Feast of Trumpets, now it's not one day, now it's two days, and now there's hundreds of blasts on each day, and the blasts are named, and now the Feast of Atonement has a trumpet, and it's blown in a particular way, at a particular tone, and it's called the Great Trumpet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the pre-tribbers have to go. This is what's so unbelievable to me. They have to go to Orthodox rabbinical tradition to interpret the Bible to make it fit their pre-trib understanding. Why do they do that? Because their understanding is not in the Bible, Mike. My understanding and the understanding of what I'm going to say are real Bible students is in the Bible. And Mm -hmm. that is, John says, at the last trumpet, at the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be completed as the prophet said. Paul says, behold, I'll tell you the mystery. At the last trumpet, the church will be raptured. Now, I don't know how it could be any clearer than that, Mike. And so the bottom line is people say, yeah, but John says the prophets. Paul wasn't a prophet. Oh, I beg your pardon. Paul not only was a prophet to the church, but he was a prophet of last day's things. Paul's the one who says, the Spirit clearly says, in the last days, terrible times will come. Paul's the one in 2 Thessalonians who says, concerning the coming of our Lord and our being caught up together with him, to be to caught up with him, uh, gathered together with him, that will not come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And then Paul goes on to talk about the Antichrist and throwing truth to the ground and the great delusion that will come. Paul talks about the bodies with which the Lord which with which we will come when we come with the Lord. Paul's the one that talks about the trumpets and the last trumpet and the return of Jesus and the coming back of the saints. Of course Paul was a prophet. He talked about last days events profusely. He prophesied profusely. You say, well where did he get this information from? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, I was caught up to paradise. I was caught up to the third heaven 12 years ago. He said, I saw things I wasn't allowed to speak of everything. But I saw these things, which means, Mike, that Paul saw what John saw 30 years before John saw it. Paul right. saw the trumpets. He understood the series of trumpets. He understood that there was a last trumpet, and he understood that that was the completion of the mystery of the rapture. John comes along 30 years later and says, Behold, at the last trumpet, at the seventh trumpet, in the days of the seventh angel, the mystery of God is going to be finished, just like the prophet said. Now, do a, do a, do a um, concordant search of the Bible, Mike, and you'll discover that only two people, well, actually three people in the Bible use the word mystery. Daniel, Paul, and Jesus. Jesus uses it in one context. Now, it's reported in three different scriptures, but it's the same thing. He says, behold, I speak to you in mysteries so that you will understand the things of the secrets of the kingdom. Of course, he's talking about parables. So that's cool, but that has nothing to do with the rapture. Daniel speaks of the mysteries that God allowed him to reveal through interpreting the dreams of the kings, etc., etc. All of that's cool, but it doesn't speak about the rapture. But you get to Paul. Paul uses the word mystery something like 20 times. And it's always connected to the mystery of the incarnation, Jesus himself, or the Jew and the Gentile becoming one flesh, becoming one witnesses, the two witnesses, Israel and the church, becoming one witness. Paul calls that a mystery in Ephesians chapter 2. One body, one witness, the two witnesses. And then he also says, and behold, I'll tell you another mystery. At the last trumpet, the church is raptured. Paul is the only prophet in the entire Bible to connect the revealing of a mystery with the last trumpet. And John, in Revelation 10:7, of all things, says, at the last trumpet, the mystery is completed, just like the prophet said. So, Mike, I'm telling you, for 30 years I've challenged people. Separate 
Revelation 10, 7 from 1 Corinthians 15, using only the Bible. Do not go to rabbinical tradition. Rabbinical tradition is what nailed Jesus to a cross. Do not use rabbinical tradition and, and perversion of the Scripture to interpret the Scripture, please. And then people say, yeah, but Paul couldn't have been talking about that because it doesn't fit the pre-trib rapture. Well, that's circular mm. reasoning, and right. that's isogetical interpretation. But if you will stay with exegetical, contextual, biblical interpretation, you cannot separate Revelation 10-7 from 1 Corinthians 15, which means, Mike, that mm. the last trumpet is the rapture, which means the first six trumpets come before the rapture. And when we look at the first six trumpets, as my new book, The Final Warning, does, and we look at the key words, they tie directly to things that have already happened and are happening before our very eyes right now. We're living in the trumpet days. We're living in prophetic times. And it's time for the church to wake up. We need to quit interpreting Scripture outside of the Scripture, and particularly based upon perverted rabbinical Hebrew tradition. That's Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you pervert the word of God, you nullify it by holding to your traditions. And for that, they crucified him. And so now the pre-tribbers want to go all the way back to the perversion of Scripture to interpret Scripture? Please. So that's, that's one example. As I said, we could talk for hours. I've got dozens of examples like that. But that's one example that proves to me that the pre-trib rapture theory is just wrong. And, and uh, the seventh trumpet is the rapture of the church. And by the way, when we get to Revelation 11 and we hear the seventh trumpet blow, mm -hmm. I mean, now we're getting into the two witnesses. That'll have to be another show. But guess what we hear? The two witnesses, which are called the olive tree and the lampstand. And by mm -hmm. the way, Revelation 120 says the lampstand's the church. And Romans 11 says the olive tree is Israel. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. And we also know in Ephesians 2 that the olive tree and the lampstand, the church and Israel, have come together, spiritually speaking, in the last days to become one man, Paul says, one witness before the Lord. So it's the church. And in Revelation 11, at the last trumpet, where Paul says the mystery of the last trumpet is the rapture, John says the last trumpet is the unfolding of the mystery. And guess what? At Revelation 11, when the seventh trumpet sounds, what do we hear? A voice from heaven that says, come up here. And the yes. witnesses went up there in the clouds mm -hmm. to be with the Lord. And the next few verses say, and now the kingdom of the Lord has come and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. I mean, Mike, it's clear wow. rapture language of surrounding you. the seventh trumpet. So again, there's just one example. And I... I've been challenging people for 30 years, show me how you can disconnect Revelation 10-7 from 1 Corinthians 15 by staying in the Bible. And for 30 years, no one has been able to answer that challenge for me. No one. Well, listen, uh, let me close with this, Carl. Uh, PB7, you know, for years we've been curious about people's take and viewpoint on, on the rapture and the end times and all that. In fact, we interviewed, we, we've always been open to hearing people out on yes. their various theories and and we in fact we interviewed a, a gentleman a, a couple of years ago um, who had a theory on the exact date of the rapture and uh, there was a lot of uh, hoop loss around that so we got a hold of this guy we interviewed him never once saying that we completely agreed with him and in fact uh, uh, he, he was uh, clearly wrong on some points at other points it was very fascinating stuff so we had him on the show and uh, we were attacked by people who said, you can't know the day and the hour. Why are you entertaining this guy? He's obviously wrong. And uh, you mentioned uh, rabid pre-tribbers. Well, when you, when you say the word rabid, I have this vision of people who hang on to their perspective so tightly that they're un unwilling to entertain, even, even entertain the biblical perspective on these things. And... Um, in fact, I was attacked by name all over all over the internet for even uh, entertaining this uh, guy. And you know, it ended up being that, that the biggest attackers were the people who were not happy that this guy had his date because it it conflicted with their date. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and, and they had their own date. And uh, for many people, it is the it is uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year, which happens to be the uh, Feast of Trumpets, right? right. And and uh, so that is an actual day, a date on the calendar every year. It's a day. 
So yeah. people who believe that Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, are ha has to be the rapture and it can happen on no other day, they are in fact date setters. But they were angry with with me for interviewing someone who had a different date. So oh, yeah. so you know these these people uh, uh, are uh, they do they do they're, they're rabid. And in fact, uh, there was one gentleman who um, who was uh, especially vicious toward me. And I our people reached out to him uh, and offered to interview him. And he, and he hides behind his uh, his YouTube channel and, and his website, and he refuses to come on the show. And and uh, you know we we uh, in fact uh, I apologize publicly for some of the statements I made, and yet no apology is forthcoming from these other people. And you know what, Carl, I have to say, and this is going to be a major announcement here. I'm done with all that. I'm just done with all the entertaining all these other theories because when we look at how the the seals have been opened and in, in, uh, historically speaking, and uh, how the trumpets are currently blowing, and that it has been fulfilled with such shocking clarity and detail that uh, that uh, now that uh, this material has come out, uh, the book by you and and uh, much of the uh, recent PP Simmons material, you know I have to say that this has become the steadfast position of PP Simmons now that uh, we have uh, put the final nail in the coffin of this of the pre-trib I want to call it nonsense uh, nonsense in so much as they have to go so far outside of the Word of God to prove their points uh, which they end up not proving anyway um, that uh, I have to say that I'm done with all the other theories out there we're not going to waste any more time with that and we're going to really try and hammer home this message that uh, the Bible is very clear on the timing of the rapture and uh, Carl, we're going to be fully on board with promoting uh, your material, your book, uh, Final Warning, because we do believe at the end of the day that it's all been inspired by the Lord. It is the, it, it is the final warning to get on board, people, because the end time is not coming. Yeah. The end time is now. Well, Mike, thank you for saying that. And let me just say, you, you know, and you said you're going to be on board promoting the book, and I appreciate that. And, and I do want to promote the book because there's nothing out there like this, and people need to see this. Now, now people have seen this, but I'm just saying there's no other book out there like this right now. And, but this is not about, as you know, Mike, it's not about promoting a book. I mean, I, right. I am a pastor. That's how I make my living. I don't have to sell any books to make a living. As a matter of fact, excuse me, on a lot of my books, and I've been blessed to be a best-selling author on two books already, and now I've got this third one coming out. I'm, it's already in pre-sales. going. It's already ranked number one in several categories on Amazon and going crazy. Uh, so it's probably going to be a best-seller as well. But I, I give away thousands, thousands of dollars of, of, of books and materials every year. I mean, this is not about money-making. I mean, you know, I have to pay you know, to buy these books as a major publisher is publishing them. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm very blessed. But but what this is about, this is about 30 years of research in my life. And people have been asking me for the last 25 years that I've been preaching this stuff in conferences, put this in a book, put this in a book. And I just never have until the last year or so. And the Holy Spirit just, I believe the Holy Spirit just overwhelmed me and said, now's the time. Now's the time, historically. You're an author, your name's out there, you're all over radio and TV. People will understand, they will believe you now. Do it now. That's what I believe the Lord spoke to me. So this is why I've put it out now. Again, this is not some sensational attempt to write some sensational book. This is what God has been showing me for 30 years. Now, this does not mean that I'm completely right and everybody else is wrong, but I'm just, I, I gave one example from the scriptures. I've begged people for 30 years. Show me how you can take these two scriptures and pull them apart using only the Bible. And, and it can't be done, Mike. It can't be done. So if that's the truth, then the seventh trumpet is the rapture. And that means the six trumpets before it are going to be blowing before the rapture. And I'm convinced, and the study that I've done with this book, when I show the first five trumpets have already blown, the sixth one is right in the middle of, of being blown, um, I use military records, I use mainstream media records, I use historical documentation, I use scientific documentation, scientific journals, as well as good, solid Bible commentary and exploration of the meanings of Hebrew and Greek words. I mean, this is not some sensational stuff I pulled off of Wikipedia or some rabid preacher's website. I mean, this stuff comes out of solid sources and resources, and I just, people need this book. Final warning. They've got to have it. They've got to understand what's happening in the world around us, Mike. Listen, Carl, we're a little long here, but I, I just have to mention this. Um, I have written six books, 
And uh, the first one was picked up by a major publisher. The last five I self-published, okay? Now, now this is yeah. going to be a reality check for a lot of people out there. My first book, published by a major publisher, has been nominated for the Nobel Prize for Literature, and it's being heavily marketed out there. And people are coming to me, they're reading the book. My other five I self-published, and I am, I am now giving them away <laughs> for free because – when you self-publish, you have to do all of the all of the marketing yourself, and you don't get the exposure that you right. get when you have a major publisher. Oh, now, yeah. you're right. You have published. This is your third book. Your first two books picked up by a major publisher. You have been on TBN, Fox News. You're getting major coverage. Yeah. Jews are being saved all yes. over the world. Muslims yes. are being saved all over the world. There is a a revival going on in the Jewish community because of the rabbi who found Messiah, which would likely, and I'm going to say I'm 100% convinced, that would not have happened without the major pull from WND Books, the pull that they have out there in the in the media community. If it wasn't for publishing through this major publisher, the message would not have gotten out. People would be still in darkness over, over the truth about their Messiah, uh, Yeshua, and uh, you may have never met Zev Porat, who has taken your book and has seen countless uh, lives saved because of the message of the gospel, which is promoted in the book, The Rabbi Who Found Messiah. And uh, so, listen, I just want to encourage people to put aside the jealousies that uh, Carl Gallops is being published and, and his books are for sale all over the world. Put aside the jealousies. Because the message is getting out there. Ask the Lord for the 19 or $20 or whatever it is to buy the book if you want the book. Because these publishers, they have to make money. They have to feed their families. These people don't publish books for free. It costs money to publish books. Yeah, there's nothing in Christian literature that's for free. And people say, well, uh, you know, I get a King James Bible for free. No, you don't. No, you no. don't. Somebody has to publish it. Somebody has Somebody to paid it. for that. Somebody has to distribute it. Somebody has to put it on Amazon. Somebody paid for it. Well, I downloaded it for free. Well, somebody else paid for it, but it wasn't right. free. You might have got it for free, but nothing can be produced for free. And so what I say is, you know, I've been published by a major publisher. I praise God. What a gift that is. And because of that, like you said, if I had self-published my, my do, uh, books, Rabbi Found Messiah and The Magic Man in the Sky, Defending the Christian Faith, I would have never been picked up by Christ and Prophecy Television and right. by TBN twice now and by TCT, Total Christian Network, and by Fox News, Alan Combs, and on right. and on. All these people, I mean, I could go on and on and drop names of big people who've had me on their television. I mean, Pat Boone. and I mean, I mean I've been... I, I've been all over the world on TV and radio, not because Carl Gallup's is so special, but because God blessed me to be published with a marketing firm behind WND Books, a major publisher. And so that's how it's done. And I praise God for that. I, so, so what I do, though, I order books from my publisher. Guess what, Mike? I have to pay for them. Right. Sure. And then I take them, not all of them, because I would go broke, but I give a ton of them away. I've sent hundreds of books. Oh, I've sent several thousands of books to Israel, and I give them to Zev Parad and others, and we give them away. I've right. sent hundreds of books to missionaries, videos to missionaries. I paid for them. Uh, this is not about me making money. I, like you said, there's so much jealousy out there. It's unbelievable. But I just I don't pay attention. I just keep going. And you know, Mike, I'm telling you, I think about the Pharisees. Think about the jealousy. Think about how they consumed each other with jealousy. And here was Jesus standing right in front of them, the incarnate word that had become flesh, God in the flesh, fulfilling dozens and dozens of prophecies that the Pharisees were familiar with, but he didn't fit their eschatological scheme, Mike. He didn't fit their eschatology. They had their own little boxed-in eschatology of who Messiah was supposed to be. So in the name of God, they crucified the Son of God outside the city of God, right outside the temple of God, thinking they were doing God a favor. That scares me to death, Mike, because I see that same attitude in the Christian community today. 
Well, and, and you know, I have to guard myself against that, uh, as as do we all. I mean, we, yes. we're all uh, fallen people, and uh, you know, as you know, Carl, uh, when I when I goof up, I'm the first to uh, apologize publicly to everyone concerned. I'm a bit of a bull in a china shop sometimes, uh, but I appreciate uh, your uh, candor here. And listen, folks, uh, we're going to close it out here. It's easier for you to pray in the. 19 or 20 dollars that it costs to buy this book than it is to combat the reality that it costs money to produce books and people need to eat and support their families there's a large organization behind this pray for the success of this book uh, you know uh, people are being saved throughout the world through the writings of Carl Gallup's and the very real uh, realities uh, that are given to us in the Bible as they are playing out in the headlines today Carl Gallup's thank you so much for being on the show Thank you so much. And let me just tell the listeners, this last book, Final Warning, we published it, guess what, in paperback, on purpose, to lower the cost. My first two books were done in hardcover. Of course, they're both bestsellers. But, you know, the retail va price of those books are like $25, $26. And on Amazon, by the time you pay shipping and handling, you pay $22, $23, $24. This one's going to be significantly less because it's in paperback. We decided to do it that way. I prefer hardback. I like a good hardback in my hand. But we want to get the word out. We want to make it as affordable as, as possible. This is not about the money with me. So let's let's get the word out, and uh, you know I encourage people buy several copies and give them away as gifts, and uh, let let's let people see what the word says, what the Bible says about the times in which we're living. Carl Gallus, everybody. My name is Mike Schusmith, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>